Welcome to The Craft. This is a special edition podcast episode, first 100 songs audiobook edition, where I'm going to walk through chapter four, which is my mixing playbook on how I mix and basically everything they don't tell you when you first start out that everything I wish I knew, I put it into this chapter for the whole mixing, editing, and my hack mastering process. I hope you get a lot of value out of this and it helps you actually make your songs sound great and getting them ready for release. Enjoy. Section two, step two, post your song. The easiest way to release your song is through a distribution company. If you do it yourself, it's hard and good luck. Chapter four, plug and play mixing playbook. It does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. Confucius. When I listened to my first songs, I didn't understand all the steps required to make quality sound. I recorded cool stuff and mixed it all together to get a finished result as fast as possible. Listening to those early attempts, there was a lot I missed and didn't get right. I didn't realize editing a song is different than mixing a song. Mixing is different than mastering. Editing prepares your recordings for mixing. Mixing makes your songs sound good. Mastering makes your songs sound good next to other songs. I learned to edit and mix with this framework. Listen, adjust, repeat. Listen to one track at a time without making tweaks and take notes. Make the adjustments you need. Repeat until you are happy with your progress. The editing process. For editing, I use the CRSPS framework to remember all the editing steps. Clean your recordings from mistakes, sibilances, and background noise. Rearrange parts of your recordings to make a better arrangement. Sync up all your recordings to sound good together and be on time. Prep your recording frequencies for mixing. Static mix your levels. Quick note, don't add effects you want to hear when you edit. Use effects to clean up your audio for mixing. You'll add effects you want to hear when you mix. A finished edit should make your recordings sound good together before using effects. Clean. The best way I've found to clean tracks is to mute all but one track at a time. Listen, adjust, repeat. If you hear mistakes, record again or cover it up with another part of your recording. Splice, or cut and paste, audio together and fade in and out the audio to help with this, often called in and out fades. You might get good results with some trial and error. Record again if you don't. In and out fades remove any popping sounds or weird audio blending that occurs when you play from no audio to audio or when splicing. Use in and out fades on every piece of audio you edit even if they are super small. Some DAWs add in and out fades for you. Check your DAW for this setting if you want it. You can also edit out the in-between space for a recording. This helps remove background noise during parts where you aren't singing or playing. For vocals, edit out your breaths for a tight pop genre feel, or keep them in with in and out fades. Turn down your breaths if they are loud. Long and loud breaths tend to be distracting and not favorable. Listen to pro music and notice the singer's breaths before and after singing to get a sense of how the pros edit. Rearrange. Splice your recordings to improve your song arrangement. For example, you could cut your intro in half, skip the verse, Add tacits, repeat a chorus. Rearranging your recordings can be fun and can help you capture the vision in your head better. Sometimes I rearrange before I clean my recordings. Do both regardless of what order you do them in. Sync. Sync your tracks in two steps, timing and nudging. Get your recordings to sync with each other, match the metronome, first. I do this one track at a time, muting all the others. I turn on the metronome to the same settings I recorded with. I drag and drop and cut and paste the audio to sound on time to the metronome. I sync tracks in this order. 1. Drums and percussion. 2. Bass. 3. Piano, keys, pads, and synths. 4. Guitars. 5. Other instruments. 6. Vocals, melody tracks, then harmony tracks. 7. Recorded effects, like swooshes, swells, etc. 
Once all my tracks sound synced, I moved to the nudging trick. I nudge tracks behind the metronome beat if they sound fast or off. Sometimes I can't put my finger on why a track doesn't sound right. Nudging forward or behind the beat often fixes this issue. The key is I have to like it. This trick helps recordings to sound relaxed and glued together, especially vocals and drums. You can nudge MIDI recordings too if it sounds good. Not everything needs nudging. Practice nudging and you'll find what sounds good. You need less nudging the more relaxed and on beat you record. Prep. Peaking. Make sure every track peaks at the same dB level. Aim for negative 12 dB. Without consistent levels, mixing can bury quiet tracks and distort loud ones. Your sound meter will dance and should give you the dB number when your audio peaks during playback. Don't turn down your track volume. Keep your track volume at 0 dB, or unity gain, for this step. Set levels with a gain plugin, or select the audio on each audio clip, and turn it down separate from the track volume. If you use track volume to automate up and down for a desired effect, use a gain meter plugin on that track. This will show you your actual peak levels on your track, so you can adjust them so your peaks are loudest at negative 12 dB. Telephone EQ. For each track competing for low end sound frequencies that I want for drums and bass, I add an EQ or equalizer plugin. Listen to each track with all the other tracks unmuted. Scoop out the low end until the track you are working on starts to sound like an old telephone. Dial it back a little until the old telephone sound is gone and leave your EQ there. That's the right spot. Use a high pass filter setting for this. See image. Not every track needs this trick. Do it for instruments and vocals you think have a low end that competes in the same low end as drums and bass. Do this by ear, not with fancy graph plugins that show you the frequencies. You'll get a better result and improve faster if you use your ears. We'll adjust the other frequencies later. Group or bus tracks. Now sort your tracks in groups and buses. A group track called Master Drums is where you assign the audio from the single tracks like Snare and Crash 1. When you turn Master Drums up, you turn up all the drum tracks assigned to that master group track. Any effects you add to the group track will affect the single tracks assigned to it as well. A bus track assigns effects to certain tracks but you still hear the original audio from each track. You add the effects to the bus track and assign certain tracks to it. You have control over the effects on the bus track separate from the audio of the other tracks. For example, if I have an acoustic guitar track, I can assign it to a reverb bus track. I have audio from my guitar track and my bus track with reverb. I can adjust each track separate from each other. With group tracks, audio only comes from the master group track and not the rest. Now group or bust your tracks. I group my tracks based on theme. Drums, keys and pad synths, guitars, vocals, sound effects, swoosh swells, etc. I'll group everything under one group called submix. This is where I'll put global effects and plugins for the mixing phase. This submix method keeps my project tidy and gives me an extra track to add effects if needed. After grouping your tracks, turn the volume of each track and group track down completely before you start mixing. Mixing. Static mix. A static mix is all your tracks leveled so that you can hear everything. Each track needs to have a slice of the pie, your mix. You should be able to hear every track in your mix. Two tools help you get there. Top-down approach and 20-minute mindset. Top-down approach. The top-down approach means making decisions for effects and volume to the submix and group tracks first. Mixing becomes easier with fewer adjustments when you tweak with the whole mix in mind. Top-down mixing also means turning down before turning up. If I turn tracks down first, I'm not at a race to the top with volume. This causes distortion and no room to work with levels. 
Turning down gives more headroom for mastering. 20-minute mindset. Your ears fatigue listening to the same music after about 20 minutes. Use the top-down approach in 20-minute sessions with 5-10 to minute rest breaks between each session. Use a timer. I do the following. 1. Set a 20-minute timer. 2. First 20 minutes. Start with all the volume faders down and the song set to repeat. Turn up each track to 0 dB until each track level sounds good together. Not every track will need to reach 0 dB in order for it to sit well in the mix. I start with the order I group the tracks in. Drums, keys, guitars, vocals, effects. Work fast, don't overthink it. 3. Take a 5-10 to ten minute break. 4. Second 20 minutes. Listen to the whole song first without adjusting it. Take notes, then make adjustments from your notes. Your adjustments should be volume. Don't add effects yet. 5. Take a 5-10 to ten minute break. Repeat step 4 until you are happy with your static mix or you feel like you've done everything you can. Once you have a static mix of your song demo, you can add a few finishing touches. I'll highlight them in the order I add them as they build upon each other. 1. EQ 2. Compression 3. Global Effects 4. Individual Effects 5. Automation 6. Reference Pocketing 7. Limiter Pro Tip Mix in Mono Mix and reference in mono, not stereo. Most times your song will play in mono through a Bluetooth speaker or your phone. Mixing in mono helps make your song sound good coming out of one speaker. During the last mixing steps, that's when you can pan your tracks in stereo and add stereo effects. Then switch back to mono for referencing. Don't forget to turn off mono for your final export. EQ. You can subtract or add EQ. Subtracting first, taking away frequencies, is more efficient than adding first. I solve muddy frequency problems with subtracting. I add EQ boosts to enhance the sound. I listen for muddy or distracting sound and see if turning them down solves the issue on the submix or group track. The steps are simple. Add an EQ plugin to the track. Turn up the frequency range causing the issue to plus 8 to plus 12 dB. Sweep back and forth with a narrow peak until you highlight the issue. Turn frequencies back down to negative 1 dB to negative 5 dB to see if that resolves the issue. I try to make less dramatic changes on a submix or group track. If the issue still isn't solved, you might have picked the wrong frequency range. Try again. You might find yourself doing several rounds of 20 minute timers at first. Don't get discouraged. You'll suck until you do the reps to improve. After solving EQ problems with subtracting, I'll add some subtle boosts. It's helpful to listen to songs you admire to understand what sounds good. Sometimes I boost the high frequencies, 5 to 18k, plus 3 to plus 8 dB on the submix and boost high mids 5k to 12k on the vocals. I do this by ear. The sky is the limit here. Every genre will have unique EQ preferences. Compression. Compression is automatic volume. Here's how it works. Compression turns down loud parts to a similar level as the quiet parts. As a result, quiet parts are easier to hear and loud parts aren't too loud. If compression is a recipe, the ingredients are attack, how fast a compressor turns on, so fast attack equals turns on fast, slow attack equals turns on slow, release, how long a compressor stays on, fast release equals turns off fast, slow release equals turns off slow, ratio, how much volume a compressor turns down. A 5 to 1 ratio means it turns down 5 times below the original volume amount. Threshold. How loud the audio needs to get to before the compressor turns on. You set this to a quiet number 
to turn the compressor on more, i.e. negative 15 dB or negative 27 dB. Makeup gain. How much to turn up the audio after leaving the compressor? This helps get audio back to the original peak level you set at negative 12 dB. I hope you're enjoying chapter four, my mixing playbook. If you know someone that could get value out of this, maybe you know a friend or that struggling, starving artist person that you know, please share this book with them. It would mean a world to me and really help that person who's struggling with the whole mixing process. If you could do that, just click share to send it to that person. And uh, that would mean the world to me and be super helpful for them because I know I struggled and didn't have this kind of guide when I started. Also, you can pick up a physical or e-reader copy of the book at jonathanvogel.com slash books. This is a hack that I learned that's super helpful. I put the physical copy on my desk. I have the e-reader tablet version as well, and I listen to it. It helps me metabolize the information so much faster and remember and apply the content that I'm reading. So you can just pick up a copy at jonathanvogel.com slash books. J-O-N-A-T-H-O-N-V-O-G-E-L dot com slash books. I apply compression in two ways, volume and effect. I use compression to help automate track volume. The settings I use for volume control would be something like fast attack, fast release, 2 to 1 to 5 to 1 ratio, negative 12 dB or so threshold until the compressor is peaking at negative 5 dB, makeup plus 2 dB to plus 5 dB as needed. I adjust makeup gain until the track volume sounds the same when I mute and unmute the compressor plugin. I try not to let the compressor give a track more total gain or volume. This will make it harder to mix. I do this by ear. The settings I tweak to use compressors as effects are slower attacks and releases, lower or higher thresholds, different ratios. I tweak until I like the effect I hear. I don't overthink this. After volume, I use compressors for effects only as needed. Global effects. I keep effects on the submix, group tracks, and buses. There's a couple reasons for this. Adding effects to every single track first results in too much effects if you add effects to the whole mix after. It takes so much time tweaking every effect on every track. It's harder to get the results you want. Certain tracks, like electric guitar, will need effects unique to them. That's okay. I try not to add them first. I try to achieve my vision with global effects first. Then I add effects track by track as needed. With global first in mind, I use the following basic effects. Reverb makes sound sustain, think big holler gym. Delay or echo makes sound repeat. Autotune tunes vocals and instruments. Chorus thickens sound. Distortion distorts sound. Flanger adds a tunnel or airplane swoosh effect to your sound. I have used many other effects than those listed here. Most times I achieve my vision with only these basic effects. Every DAW is different for how to use effect plugins. Once I start recording and editing, using plugins becomes natural and intuitive. Plugins are easier to use than you think. Start with your DAW default plugins and build your collection from there. Individual effects. If global effects don't achieve my vision, I add more effects to the tracks that need them. Less is more here. I do this by ear as needed. Automation. This step ensures I bring forward all the little parts of a song that get lost or drowned out by other tracks. I use compression and manual volume automation to turn up and down parts of the song. Vocal expressions, quiet vocal phrases or intro words, hard to hear instrument riffs, any track I want to emphasize for a section. Sometimes I turn up a guitar rhythm for a verse to give it a tight groove feel. Sometimes I turn up a couple words from the vocal that's hard to hear in the chorus. I listen for improvements and make little manual volume adjustments on the audio. 
I'll use a 20 minute timer technique for this to work fast and not miss anything in this step. Reference pocketing. Reference pocketing is when I compare and tweak my song demo to sound good next to pro level songs. There's two ways I do this with a bounced track and with the submix. I used my submix to keep everything in one project. I try to avoid the temptation of making distracting tweaks from previous steps. To help with this, sometimes I'll bounce or export my project to an MP3 file and add it to a new project for this step. Either way works. I'll then grab three to five pro songs from YouTube or song purchases and add them on new tracks next to mine. I'll turn down all the reference songs peak levels to my song's current peak level. The big moment has arrived. How good have my efforts been up to this point? I use the listen, adjust, repeat process to reference. Here's a detailed breakdown of how I reference. 1. Use a 20 minute timer. 2. Listen to each reference track and take notes on what you like about each one. 3. Listen to your song last and take notes on what you could do to make it sound closer to the pro songs. 4. Adjust your track. This usually means adding EQ and compression to your track or submix to better mirror the pro tracks. 5. If you realize a big mistake you made with an overdone effect or something, go back and make that change. Reset your peak levels for your references if the peak level is different after you re-export your song. 6. Save your project every few minutes to avoid losing your work when, not if, your DAW crashes throughout each 20 minute session. 7. Take a 5 to 10 minute break. 8. Repeat. After 20 or so minutes of referencing, you can lose perspective. Referencing can get frustrating if you don't do it right. Frustration happens when you realize how much you suck. Take breaks even for a couple days. Fresh ears after a few days helps you make better referencing decisions. After a few more sessions though, it's time to move on. You're releasing a song demo, not a pro level song. As you reference, don't forget to compare your song to the pro songs you've selected for reference on your mixing speakers, car speakers, earphones, headphones, laptop speakers, smartphone, TV sound system, portable Bluetooth speaker, and any other listening device you have. Reference as many listening environments as you can. Listen to the pro songs first, then your demo. Take notes on the differences, then head back to your studio and adjust. Take a break while you re-export, then head back out to the car. Repeat. This is what I do to get my song demo to sound as good as I can. Limiter. After referencing, I use a limiter plugin to turn up my submix to commercial listening volume. A limiter turns up your mixed demo to a volume for commercial use on platforms like Spotify and Apple Music. I set the limiter to peak at negative 3 dB and turn up the limiter volume so that the submix meter is dancing most of the time near negative 3 dB. I then compare my demo to the reference tracks back at their regular volume. If my demo still doesn't sound good next to the pro songs, I resort to my hack mastering or pocketing trick. Hack mastering or pocketing. I compare each frequency range of my song demo to each frequency range of each pro song. I start with these ranges in order. Low end, low mids, mids, high mids, high end. I set an auto filter plugin to a peak shape to highlight each frequency range and turn down all the rest. What I hear in effect is only those frequencies. Here's how I use it. 1. Set a 20 minute timer. 2. Group pro songs and my demo together under one group track. 3. Add the auto filter plugin to group track. 4. Start with low end frequency range. 5. Solo or mute all but one track and listen to each pro song and take notes. 6. Solo and listen to your demo and take notes. 7. Add EQ to your demo track and make little tweaks to get this frequency range to sound like the pro songs. 8. Turn off the auto filter plugin. 
Nine, flip back and forth between soloing your demo and the pro songs to hear the difference. Ten, if you hear improvement, repeat from step three, but with the next frequency range. This process is how I make my demos sound as good as I can with the least amount of effort and frustration. I make sure to run out to the car again and any other speakers and reference after any pocketing I've done. Export settings. After limiting and pocketing, I export a high quality song file. Exporting settings can be confusing, but here's my simple recipe. File format. The type of file you save like WAV, AIFF, FLAC, or MP3. WAV or FLAC types are higher quality but bigger files. MP3 is smaller but lower quality. Bit depth. The number of bits used to represent each audio sample, i.e. 16-bit or 24-bit. Try to match the bit rate your audio interface records at. A higher bit rate can mean higher quality. Sample rate. The number of audio samples taken per second, usually measured in kilohertz, i.e. 44.1 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz, match your audio interface if you can. A higher sample rate can mean higher quality. Normalization. When your DAW adjusts exported audio volume to a specific level, often set at 0 dB. I usually don't add this. Dithering. Introduces background noise during export to improve sound quality happens when reducing bit depth. Experiment to see what sounds best. Render range or selection. Export the entire project or only selected parts. Most times you'll select your master track. Channels. The number of audio tracks in the exported file, i.e. stereo, mono, surround. Pick stereo for your final export. Master bus processing. Effects and processing applied to the master bus. Make sure to include it for your final export. Bounce or export. The process of saving your final mix. Some DAWs use bounce as a term for exporting. Once you click export, your DAW may take a few minutes to make your song file. Pro tips to remember. Export the turned down reference songs with your mix track when referencing. This helps keep the volume similar in the car or phone speakers. Export MP3s when referencing. An MP3 exports faster and takes less space. Mute reference tracks and cut off ends of them if the audio is longer than your final demo export. This avoids exports of your song with extra dead silence at the end. Double check anything you muted or turned off that you want in your final export. Turn off mono for your final export. Whoa, that was a meaty chapter. This is how I make a song. I still use most of these steps today. I hire out for the parts I'm not good at now. So far, you've learned to take out your garbage, write your first hundred songs, practice the art of playing and singing, Build a home studio. Learn how to use your studio gear. Edit, mix, reference, and export a song demo. Didn't I say I'd deliver? Now you should have a WAV or MP3 file for your song. What do you do with it? The next section of this book will share how I post my demos on all major music platforms. I'll show you what works, what doesn't work, what mistakes I made, and what shortcuts I use. Let's get your song released. I hope you enjoyed chapter four, the mixing playbook. Basically, it's everything I learned that I didn't know when I started on that whole process. You got it all in one chapter here. The next chapters are going to finish out the first half of the book, everything from copyright distribution royalties, all that good stuff to music videos to mindset it's all there packed into this next episode so make sure you stick around so you get the full value and i'll see you in the next episode take care you're awesome this has been first 100 songs written by jonathan vogel
Read by Jonathan Vogel. Copyright 2024, jonathanvogel.com. Audio production copyright 2024, jonathanvogel.com.